Evans Mentor is ready for us at the main hall as we begin the discussion on solvency and liquidity issues in the banking sector. Evans, take over. We're ready for you. Zimbabwe after nearly four decades as president. Stuff like Asen Wenger finally retired. Guaranteed your six points in the EPL season. I mean, whilst he was there, you definitely know that once you play home and away, you get six points. Now we don't know because we don't know who is going to take over from him. Then, obviously, there is also the morning when the Bank of Ghana announced the collapse of UT and Capital Banks. That is a major event as well. That's an event you must remember where you were when it happened. I do. I remember the morning where I was when that announcement was made and what I did right after that. In fact, what I did right after that, you financial guys will tell me it was a very rational thing to do if you're investing. I went to my bank, one of the banks rumored to also be in trouble, took all my money out and took it to, and took it to some other bank. Not that I knew that that other bank I was taking to was going to survive, but it had been rumored. I know rumor works when in, in, in the financial circle. So that's exactly what I did. And I believe a lot of people did that. And then we've also had Unibank. If you ask me, these events, these two events, the collapse of the capital in UT Bank and Unibank, if you ask me, these two events really define the banking sector. And that really puts in context why today's event, today's forum, it's such an important event in a national calendar. And we must applaud Stambic Bank and the graphic business for putting it together. So how do you boost the health of the banking sector at a time of great uncertainty? Well, listen, I'm not an expert. That is why we are here. So ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome to the Labadi Beach Hotel, to the Stambic Bank Graphic Business Breakfast Forum on a very exciting topic as far as liquidity and solvency and boosting the health of the banking sector is concerned. We are live on Joy 99.7 FM. We are also live on the Joy News Channel on Multi TV. We are live on the Graphic News app because you're streaming there as well. And of course, we are live on myjoyonline.com. My name is Evans Mensa. If you check the program this morning, we are going to have an opening prayer. But we're supposed to have a pastor do that. I will do that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with our opening prayer, if you may. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for another morning, for life, and for giving us traveling mercies to make our way here to the Labadi Beach Hotel. We pray for a successful program this morning. In Jesus' name, have we prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. I will now welcome the MD of the graphic group, Nana Kwekude, to give us his opening address. Ladies and gentlemen, Nana Kwekude. edition of Graphic Business Stambic Breakfast Meeting. As usual, this is the platform where the business community share views on critical issues relating to business and the well-being of the Ghanaian economy. Today, the meeting will discuss another important topic, liquidity and solvency management, boosting the health of banking in Ghana. Recently, the country has sometimes woken up to news of bank collapse or takeover. 
by the Bank of Ghana due to liquidity challenges. Depositors have always reacted to such news in a manner that shows clearly that they are worried. With some of them attempting to close their accounts with the affected banks, notwithstanding assurances by the Bank of Ghana that their deposits are safe. This, lens, this, sorry, this leads to the loss of confidence in the banking sector, a danger we must avoid because of the critical role banks play in mobilizing funds for productive activities. To boost confidence in banking, therefore, requires dealing with one of the fundamental causes of the problem, which is how liquidity and solvency to keep banks healthy. This meeting, therefore, is meant to generate the kind of informed discourse that will result in actions that promote good liquidity management by banks to keep them consistently solvent to boost confidence in the banking sector in the country. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we will thus have a conversation on relevant questions such as an overview of liquidity and solvency issues in the banking sector, global best practice, and the best way to manage liquidity to be solvent in the industry. I have confidence in the panel to lead the discussions because their backgrounds make them perfectly suitable to handle the topic for the desired result. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I welcome you to the Graphic Business Stambic Bank Breakfast Meeting. I have a lively discussion. I invite the audience to enjoy the deliberations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nana. We also welcome brief open remarks from Benjamin Mensah, who is the head of Wealth West Africa with the Stambic Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Benjamin Mensah. Many thanks, Ivan. Dr. Addison, Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Nana Kweku Diai, um, Acting MD Graphic Communications Group, Mr. Vish Shagbo, the Senior Country Partner for PricewaterhouseCoopers, and uh, Mr. Kwame Nasmini, Head of Corporate and Investment Banking, Stambik, leaders of industry, colleague bankers, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to this morning's event. This program is fast becoming a must attend or a must listen to. Um, at Stambik Bank, our brand promise is Africa is our home, we drive a growth, and for that matter, Ghana. That's exactly what we've been trying to do for the past few years through this program. There's a platform to mainstream, to shape, to influence, and mainstream the conversations that matter to Ghana. We've worked with graphic business on this program for the last three years. This is the ninth of such uh, meetings. Among others, we've touched on key conversations. We've spoken about deposit insurance, about the new tax law, about the EPA, about the budget deficit in a, an election year, about the private and public dialogue on stability, growth, and jobs. Today's subject is no less topical. It is indeed a very, very appropriate at this time. Let's just say banking is very, very serious business. And you've heard from the earlier speakers. I won't go into that, and I won't steal the thunder of the, the panelists. I'm very positive that we will find the discourse quite stimulating and insightful. Please do enjoy the rest of the morning and the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. 
So we'll start with the main course for this morning. And I would now invite my panelists, starting with Mr. Kwamina Sumening. He is the Director of Corporate and Investment Banking at Stambic Bank, who's joining us this morning uh, to start the conversation. Uh, Mr. Kwame Sumeni, if you're here, I'll, I would uh, invite you to kindly take your seat on the, on the stage for me. Uh, the other panelists will join you very shortly. Please, a round of applause for Mr. Kwame Sumeni, the Director of Corporate and Investment Banking. Thank you, sir. Also joining the panel this morning is Vish Ashiago. He's a senior partner with PwC, the PricewaterhouseCoopers. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for him. Thank you very much, Vish. Thank you. We will also have very shortly joining us a, the Bank of Ghana uh, rep will join us very shortly. Then the conversation will begin. In fact, I'm going to quickly catch the rest of my panelists uh, up there, and we'll start with our presentations. So we'll start with the, the, the first presentation uh, from Mr. Kwamina Asumani, who is the Director of Corporate Investment Banking. Um, so you, do you want to Oh, you want to do it from here? Okay, great. He's, he's fine sitting. Fantastic. So, yes, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Evans. And good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have the honor of starting. I uh, understand the Bank of Ghana is not here, so I guess I can make a few comments and get away with it before they get here. So today's topic is about solvency and, and liquidity and, and I'm supposed to give a few comments before we get into the Q&A. Um, I don't have a prepared presentation. It's just going to be more conversational. But I'd like to start by just giving a brief overview of solvency and liquidity as it, as it relates to the banking sector. Uh, because ever since the topic came up, there have been quite a number of people um, trying to get a better understanding of what exactly solvency refers to and what exactly liquidity refers to in the context of banks. Um, so solvency and liquidity are essentially two barometers of financial health for, for, for a bank. Uh, solvency looks at long-term health and then liquidity, short-term health. But they both measure the ability of a bank to meet its, its obligations. So the solvency focuses on a bank's ability to meet its long-term commitments, and then the liquidity focuses on a bank's ability to meet its short-term commitment. Uh, oftentimes, solvency is also equated with a state where uh, a business's liabilities exceed its assets. And, and that happens to businesses, not just banks alone. So a bank is deemed insolvent when its deposits are in excess of its assets. On the other hand, liquidity refers to a state where a business or a bank can't meet its short-term obligations. So essentially, depositors can't get their money back when they do approach the bank. It also refers to a state where a bank can't pledge its assets to raise cash or can't sell its assets to raise cash quickly. And the two are somewhat related. But all things considered, so a, a lack of solvency leads to liquidity challenges and not the other way around. I think sometimes there's some confusion that a lack of liquidity leads to solvency. But I'll say that when a business is insolvent or a bank is insolvent, it leads to much less confidence in that institution's ability to, to repay deposits and ultimately its ability to attract deposits wanes. Now, looking ahead at the industry, there are three areas that I would like to focus my comments on. I think the first is on regulation. The second is on behavior. And then the third is on policy, government policy. So the Bank of Ghana has taken steps to restore banks back onto a path of, of, of profitability and sustainability. And as it relates to, 
solvency and liquidity. There are three areas where the bank is making some changes or some adjustments to enable the banks to build up their levels of solvency and liquidity. And those three speak to the assets of the bank, the liabilities of the bank, and then the equity of the bank. I'll start with the, um, the assets of the bank. And the assets of the bank are essentially in loans and, uh, and, and marketable securities together with some cash. Banks typically keep very low levels of, of, of fixed assets. So what the central bank has done with the new capital regulations, where it set out a capital adequacy ratio, is to ensure that banks put a cap on their risk assets. So the capital adequacy ratio puts, establishes a relationship between the extent to which a bank grows its assets and the extent to which it has capital to serve as a buffer for those assets. And that ratio hitherto used to be 10%. It's been increased to 13% to ensure that the amount of capital that a bank keeps in its balance sheet to, to, to serve as a buffer against losses on its asset book is, is increased. The second speaks to the liabilities. And in there, the bank, has, has, the bank of Ghana has, is introducing some aspects of the Basel II and Basel III regulations where banks are now, will, will soon be expected to comply with a liquidity coverage ratio. Now, this liquidity coverage ratio ensures that banks don't invest all their, uh, all their deposit funds into long-term loans and create mismatches. These mismatches arise from, 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 the, from the way the banks operate. So banks accept deposits, and then we grant them out as loans. Oftentimes, you know, the loans don't pay, pay out as well as we expect them to do. These loans become bad. Depositors show up, need their cash, there isn't enough cash. So by ensuring that the banks set aside some of their liquidity to meet their short-term obligations, banks then avoid an issue relating to solvency or relating to liquidity. And then the last bit has to do with banks' equities. And the bank, again, again my central bank is introducing a leverage ratio. And that leverage ratio ensures that the amount of equity in the business are commensurate with the size of the business, the asset of the business. And that ratio would ensure that banks, as they grow in size, are either forced to retain profits at a faster rate or to raise equity to, um, to, to bolster their, their, their equity levels. So these three ratios are designed to improve the bank's solvency as well as liquidity. Uh, the liquidity capital ratio addresses the bank's liquidity, and then the leverage as well as the capital adequacy ratios address the bank's solvency. So that is what the regulator is doing uh, with respect to banks. The second aspect that I wanted to speak about was about behavior. And uh, in the pre-discussion that we had, you know, the, the host posed the question and, and wanted my view as to whether the blame could be laid at the, at, at the doors of the, of, of the regulator for what has happened. And, and I hold a completely different view. I think the blame has to be shared equally and that Without it, with, even with a change in regulation, if behaviors don't change, we will find ourselves in the same position. If you look at the banks, um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the problem credits were well known way before the default happened. Banks continue to lend to those credits despite the challenges and invariably these businesses were not able to repay. I think banks would need to change their posture to problem credits and their ways of approaching credit origination. I think there's a perception, and, and that perception is, uh, is grounded in reality, that there's so much emphasis on collateral as opposed to cash flow. And so by focusing on the collateral, and a lot of the collateral is, um, is not collateral that you can easily market, market. And these are collaterals that have very high values that bear very little to the, the extent of demand. And so the banks would have to change the approach to credit origination, the approach to, 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 to reacting to problem credits. And, 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 the, and the, other, the other area where we would need a change is in the behavior of corporates. Um, if you look at most of the debtors that have caused the banks problems, there are certain recurring themes. These businesses had very weak balance sheets. 
they had borrowed from multiple banks. Uh, a lot of them were part of big diversified conglomerates where you, know, you had one cash cow that effectively was supporting many other businesses and invariably the weaker businesses became a drain on the stronger businesses. Uh, you, you saw a lack of respect for financial covenants, financial reporting was poor, budgeting, cash flow disciplines were not entrenched. And so you need to see a change in the behavior of the businesses that have been borrowing from, uh, from, from the banks. A lot of these businesses, rather than go looking for equity at the onset, they look to go solo. You know, if you look at the world over, most entrepreneurs start by calling three or four other um, like-minded investors, pull their capital resources as well as their ideas together and set up business. I think the Ghanaian way is to go solo and, 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 and you borrow to start your business as opposed to finding equity partners. And then down the line, when things go bad, then you begin to look for equity. By that time, it's a bit too late. So you need shareholders to change their mindsets as to how they, uh, they, 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 they set up their business. And then the last is on policy. I think that we will need to see some policy, policy interventions to encourage capital formation. Uh, our market is scattered with lots of uh, debt-seeking investors and debt-providing institutions as opposed to entities that uh, are looking to invest equity or capable of uh, pledging equity. And we'll need to see government policy shift towards, um, the, the, towards a greater level of capital formation. Um, in developed markets, that are, are, are progressive, you see many more venture capital funds, the ability to raise grants to start businesses are more prevalent. And ultimately, what that does is that it builds businesses with very strong equity bases that are less reliant on bank funding at the very early stages. A lot of the issues we've seen in the banks are as a result of banks taking on the risk that shareholders should be taking on. And so the banks end up taking equity risk. And as we know, equity risk is a much higher risk than debt risk. And invariably, uh, the erosion that we've seen in bank balance sheets has arisen out of uh, banks taking by the protective risk. So I'd say that those are the three areas that I'd like to focus going forward. The first, as I highlighted, is regulation. The second is, um, uh, the, the second is, uh, is on bank be on behavior. And then the third is on policy. But uh, I'd say that uh, all, all things considered, we're on the right track as, an, as, as a country. And with these shifts, uh, we should see a return to health and prosperity in the sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, a round of applause uh, for him. Can I hear a bigger one, please? And that's Mr. Kwame Nesuman's view uh, and initial take, food for thought there, laying out for us what he believes, uh, first diagnosing the problem and laying out for us what he believes the solution could be. We'll be interrogating that very shortly, but I'm delighted to say that we've just been joined by L.C. Addo of Waji, who is the second Deputy Governor. Uh, Mrs. thank you very much for joining us, and I'd like to invite you to join us uh, on the panel. Uh, a round of applause for her, please, as she joins us on the panel. Pamela, you may not get away with it after all. Yes. I'll now invite Vish Ahiabo with a senior partner with the PwC, the Prize with the House Coopers, um, to also give us his opening remarks, setting his own tone for the subsequent conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, Vish. Thank, thank you very much, Evans, and uh, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, uh, colleague panel members. Um, my my job actually has been made very easy by Kwame Na's opening remarks because I think he adequately or ably covered uh, a lot of the issues that are pertinent to this discussion. Uh, but my few remarks are really related to how the, uh, the global financial system um, has also learned from or reacted in the face of similar challenges that have been experienced. So 
if we take a step back to, or a few steps back perhaps to um, about 10 years ago when we had the uh, big global financial crisis, uh, I think in large part the problems that were experienced at that time are exactly due to the issues we're discussing today, issues around uh, liquidity or lack thereof uh, insolvency. So I just want to dwell on that a little bit and then draw some of the lessons that came from there, which I think uh, will help us in our local context fashion a way forward. So if you look at what led essentially to the financial crisis of uh, 2008, uh, 2009, um, again, banks taking more and more risk due to market conditions, uh, regulation perhaps not being as proactive or as strong as one would have expected, especially in the face of uh, a lot of the financial innovation uh, and complex transactions that were uh, being innovated or being developed at that time, uh, which typically were running ahead of the capacity of regulators uh, in those various uh, jurisdictions. Ultimately, um, the, the system ran into problems uh, and some of the, the, the headline cases, I'm sure we all remember when banks like the Royal Bank of Scotland or RBS uh, in the UK went into trouble. Uh, Northern Rock, uh, also in the UK, also ran into problems. Uh, and then, of course, the major one that shook the system was uh, when Lehman Brothers eventually collapsed and could not make it through, largely as a result of the liquidity issues it was facing uh, at that point in time. So. This is particularly important for the banking sector for, 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 for two reasons, I would suggest. One is that the sector is so interconnected that if one or two banks begin to run into problems, it very quickly affects the whole sector if it's not sufficiently managed or if it's not properly managed. Secondly, the, uh, the banking system largely runs on the basis of confidence. So where confidence in the system is shaken, then the whole sector becomes a little um, uncertain, let me put it that way. And of course, because of the role that banks play in economies, it is particularly important that we pay attention to these issues. So what really has been the response? Um, I think Kwame not touched on the three issues. He spoke about regulation, he spoke about policy, and he spoke about behavior. The, in the global context, most of the, or the strongest response came from stronger regulation. Um, and internationally, I think the Basel framework is what we use to benchmark the, uh, the strength of regulation across countries. And so following on from that crisis in 2009, we saw upgrades to the Basel framework, Basel III, which then brought into place stronger liquidity um, and stronger solvency requirements, which many countries have now moved to adopt, which we also in our territory, I'm happy to say, are also moving uh, to, to adopt to, to deal with some of these challenges that have the risk of uh, disrupting our system and ultimately the whole economy. I'm not going to spend time defining liquidity and solvency because Kwame now has already done that, uh, but hopefully you can see that um, these are critical to the proper functioning um, um, of the system. I think that um, from a global perspective, a lot of the other territories are perhaps ahead of us in terms of what they've done to manage liquidity and solvency risk. We are catching up, and I believe we're catching up quickly. Um, I think that we, we have some work to do, but I think we're on the right track. I'd like to leave it there for now, um, and then maybe when we get into the Q&A session, we can delve into a little bit more of the specifics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A uh, round of applause for Vish. I hear about that with the Pricewaterhouse Coopers. I would now invite Mrs. Alvaji to make her own opening remarks, and remember she is a second deputy governor. Madam, welcome again. You have the floor. Thank you very much, the moderator. And uh, good morning to my fellow pa panelists, Kwamina Vish. Um, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I bring you greetings from Governor Addison, who 
would very much have loved to be here this morning, but has had to respond to um, an urgent matter that um, is on his desk right now. So uh, please bear with him, and uh, he sends his best wishes for very fruitful deliberations this morning. Um, we're really glad to be here. Thank you for extending a hand of in invitation to us. Uh, this is a, an important forum of stakeholders, and we very much welcome the opportunity to be here to be part of this discussion. Uh, my previous, the previous speakers have, I think, done my work or half of my work for me. Kwamina, thank you for that um, intervention. I think you lay out the issues quite nicely um, from all perspectives, uh, very much so, especially on the regulatory side. Vish, thank you for bringing in the global perspective, which is very relevant for us as we chart a path forward uh, for a more resilient financial system. On the part of Bank of Ghana, I just want to add that we take our mandate of ensuring a stable financial system in Ghana, very important. It is so critical um, to, the, to the survival of the entire financial system, but not just that. It is critical for the survival of our economy, and it's critical for where we want to go as a nation in terms of our economic development. And given how seriously we take our role, we have taken a very critical rule, um, look at the current financial system and how we got here and how we may be able to move forward, uh, charting a stronger financial system that works for everyone. Let me just touch on something that um, Vish mentioned about interconnectedness in the financial system. I just want to break that down a little bit more. If you take Ghana's financial system, it's made up of the banking sector, it's made up of other deposit-taking institutions, it's made up of insurance, it's made up of um, securities, which is the capital market um, part of the financial system. You will find that 85% of, of the assets in the financial system are lodged, really, in the banking sector. The banking sector alone carries about 85% of the entire financial system. Uh, added to that is the issue of interconnectedness. Banks are interconnected with savings and loans and with insurance firms and with fund managers and with broker dealers. If you have a situation where you don't have a strong banking system, your entire financial system is at risk and you do have systemic problems on your hands. When we look at examples of financial crisis in the past, whether you take the savings and loans crisis of the US, uh, whether you take the Asian financial crisis, whether you take the global financial crisis, it takes countries and regions sometimes 10 years to recover economically from a major crisis. So we've been blessed in Ghana. We didn't get hit by the global financial crisis as Europe did. Um, as Nigeria did. In 2009, Nigeria had a major banking crisis on its hands, tied to the global financial crisis somehow. And they had to deal with about 10 distressed, severely distressed banks. Uh, they, they managed to deal with it and clean up the financial system. We were spared that. And it seems to me that we're having to learn some of the lessons that major economies learned at least 10 years ago about what not to do <laughs> when you're running a bank or what not to do uh, with your banking system. <laughs> Many of the issues that Kwamina mentioned, whether you're talking about poor risk management, poor corporate governance, uh, poor lending models of the banks, uh, on the side of the borrowers, about not being prudent in their credit behavior and all of that. All of these were part of what caused the global financial crisis, which started in one country, and before you knew it, had become a major economic problem in, in the United States, and had become a major problem in Europe and in emerging markets. Uh, we have learned the lessons. Although we were not hit by it, in our own recent past, we're beginning to learn some lessons which are not very different from what, what other countries have learned over the years. The lessons are the same. 
if you take money from the public as a bank or as a financial institution, the public has confidence in you because you have a license issued by a regulator. The public understands that there is a regulatory body that is making sure that their money that you hold is safe. It is incumbent on the regulator to ensure that there is a, a regulatory framework that when complied with, banks or other financial institutions are more likely than not to be safe and sound and to adopt behavior that is consistent with a resilient financial system. And that promotes the confidence and trust of the public in the financial system. We as regulators take this role seriously, as I said at, at the beginning. And in light of that, we have put in place a number of measures to ensure that we do have a stronger financial system going forward. And some of the lessons we have learned in our immediate past, which have caused the closure of two banks and the official administration of a third bank, would not recur going forward. As a result, we're hoping that banks increase their minimum capital by December uh, of this year. We're looking forward to banks beginning to implement the Basel II and III capital framework, which promotes a more resilient capital base for banks, which will protect them from risks um, out of the operations. Where we've just um, issued our, fit, our, our corporate governance directive, which would hopefully promote better corporate governance standards in the sector. We're coming out with a fit and proper person requirement, which all bank shareholders, directors, and senior management would have to um, comply with before they have anything to do with the banking sector. We're coming out with bank holding company regulations so that parent companies or banks and affiliates of banks are all regulated in a way that ensures that their dealings with banks do not create problems for banks and the depositors whose monies are kept in the banks. And we have a list of other um, actions we're taking. And in due course, we'll be consulting with the public for feedback. But let me just say that with the objective of ensuring that the banks are safe and also that the deposits that they hold are safe, we're serious about implementing a deposit protection scheme. An act was passed in 2016 to establish a deposit protection scheme for Ghana. We have recently had the act amended so that its provisions uh, can better help to establish a, a first class deposit protection scheme. And we're hoping that in the next few months, running into the, to early next year, this deposit protection scheme will be up and running so that depositors would have more confidence in putting their monies with banks. But as Kwamina said, this is something that all stakeholders need to take seriously. It is in everybody's interest that the banking sector is strong and resilient. The regulator, Bank of Ghana, we are committed to doing our part. We expect the banks to do up their part. We expect shareholders and directors and management to do their part. And we expect you, the users of the banking system, to do your part by asking your banks the right questions and by supporting regulatory action, which ensures that deposits are safe and that the entire financial system is safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A bigger round of applause for Mrs. Obwaji. Uh, I, I think that is the most important part of the conversation uh, this morning. And so we'll start with some of the basics, really. I want to touch on some of the key issues that has been uh, uh, pretty front and center as far as the banking sector is concerned, very topical in the last few uh, weeks or months, uh, because I have read somewhere that this year is probably one of the busiest years in the banking sector and uh, Madam Mahaji had laid out a lot of the regulations and new uh, projects that the Bank of Ghana is rolling out just to make sure that the banking sector is healthy, strong, and alive. And that's where I start. Uh, uh, Vishikha, I'll start with you because you guys do a lot of 
auditing of the banking sector, and you've, you've uh, had the privilege of assuming the uh, management of uh, one of the banks, correct? Um, I'm not sure whether managing, management of the bank is the right way to put it. We are uh, receivers of uh, okay. the two banks that uh, had their license reviewed last year. Good. That's so. why this question comes to you. Okay. And it is <laughs> and it, it, it's fundamentally about, and, and be honest with us, what is the health of the banking sector right now? We, we are talking about liquidity and solvency, boosting the health of the banking sector. Tell us in, in real honest terms, and we know you've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, in fact, I was just reading a graphic online, a uh, graphic business that published, quoting the Bank of Ghana governor, I think in March, stating that more than 270 rural uh, and, 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 and other financial institutions were in trouble. Um, we know some audit had been done a couple of years back, uh, pointed to some nine banks that were in trouble. Say Some of them say two of them had already gone under. What really is the health of the banking sector as we speak? Are we on life support, as some have suggested, or we are thriving? Evans, I think that's a, a rather tricky question for me to respond to uh, in full. Um, because the Bank of Ghana itself, I think in some of the recent statements they've made, have, have acknowledged that there are some issues in the banking sector. But to your question, I would not say that the whole sector is in distress. I think the sector is sufficiently strong for what we needed to do for us as a country. That being said, we all know that there are pockets of challenge. But then that's why, as Deputy Governor just told us, there are a lot of initiatives currently ongoing. So by December 2018, December this year, all those initiatives having been implemented, we should see a stronger sector emerging. Now, the strength of the sector that emerges could be as a result of um, uh, the exit of maybe some of the weaker participants, perhaps, or the further strengthening of uh, the, the currently strong participants. But to your question, overall, I would not suggest that the sector is in distress. There are pockets of challenges. Uh, I think we are aware of those. The regulator is aware of those, and there are ongoing initiatives to address those. Um, Kwamina, you want to add to that question? Because it's really at the heart of this conversation. We need to understand where we are, and then we can move forward. I think you laid out that, but if you narrow in that, because you work in the banking sector, I know you work in a bank, so you might not, but tell us, from where you work and what you've seen, are we healthy? I'll say that we're healthy. I, I agree entirely with what Vish has said, uh, that the, 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 the industry is largely healthy. Uh, the banks have just published their financials for, for the 2017 financial year. And if you look through it, you can tell that um, most of the banks have essentially recovered from, from the challenges that they faced uh, probably in the 2015, 2016 timeframe. Most, operative word. Most. We're so we still have some still struggling, correct? Correct. And I think how many? Just to borrow. <laughs> well, I, I don't know the number. Vish, you know? Um, I, I can't say offhand. There are some banks that are struggling. Like Roughly? I <laughs> uh, I'll allow Kwame now to continue his response. <laughs> <laughs> so, just going back to the point I made, most of the banks have seem to have recovered from, from the shocks that they faced. But again, I think it's important to pick off from where the second deputy governor uh, left off, saying that uh, the actions that are being taken by, by the Bank of Ghana are designed to return the banking sector to sustainability. But I think importantly, uh, you should also acknowledge the, the efforts that the banks themselves have taken. You see the first, starting with the shareholders, a lot of shareholders have delayed or have suspended their dividends and have decided to re-inject their profits. Quite a number of the shareholders have also injected additional capital to, uh, to boost uh, the balance sheets. Uh, there's been a bit of a shift in the approach to credit origination as well as dealing with, with problem credits. And, and the banks themselves have become much more vigilant than you could say they were previously. And, and, and these are uh, these are the first steps to returning to 
you know, a sustained path. But I'd say that on the, on the whole, the, the sector is very healthy. If you look at the capital adequacy ratios, which is a measure of the extent of the equity buffers, they were quite healthy across the board, as, as, as indicated in the financials. So I wouldn't say there's a, there's a case for widespread panic. There are isolated pockets, as, as my other two panelists have admitted. But I think it's, 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 it's similar to what you'd have in any, any industry where one or two operators might be challenged. But that might not be necessarily reflective of the entire industry. There you go, one or two. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Hadji, let, let me ask you then following from this. And so clearly we still have pockets, just, just to quote Kwamina. Um, and one of the, a pocket was Unibank. And in that statement that you issued, very thorough detailed statement, you stated that for the past two years, in fact, you've been assisting um, them, you know, trying to get them to sort of um, thrive again, so to speak. I'm guessing that for these pockets, the Bank of Ghana is still assisting, trying to help. Um, and because you work there, you can tell us, are these pockets meeting your expectations in terms of the turning around, turning around their fortunes to safeguard our deposits? Thank you very much. Let me start by saying, uh, just as my two other colleagues have said, the banking sector is very strong and it's resilient. Okay? It is broadly doing very well. There are some banks who are at different stages in their recovery and we are monitoring them very closely and making sure that they're on track. And so far we have no cause to be concerned. And just as Kwamina said, this is really not uh, an odd phenomenon. Um, you, banks have a life cycle from birth, or from the, from the cradle to the grave, if you will. Um, you license banks, you give them conditions on which they operate, you give them rules to operate with, they take money, they operate. As a going concern, banks may be at one stage or the other they may catch a cold at some point. You have a toolkit under the law as a regulator that allows you to take different actions at different times with the banks, with their shareholders, with directors, with managers to ensure that they recover from their ailment, whether it's a cold, whether it's a flu, whatever it is, okay? So that is something that we do every day. And it may be that a bank suffers uh, an ailment at one time or the other. Strong regulation and strong supervision helps banks recover because you tell them what to do to straighten up and to deal with their issues and they come back on track. So when we talk about pocket, all we're saying is that at some point or the other, given the very difficult you know, macroeconomic environment within which banks operated, also as a result of poor governance and poor risk management systems, some banks got very sick. We have put in place measures, and with very strong monitoring, many of those banks have recovered. There remain a, a, a few uh, areas of vulnerability, which we're working very closely with them. And we continue to hope that they, they, they would be stronger and better. And we've put in place a number of measures. We continue to put in place these measures. And so we have no cause to be worried at That's all. Begin to interrogate the, um Hello? Let's not begin to get target the specific measures. Uh, let's go into some of the specifics. I guess let's start with the obvious, most controversial one, the 400 million new capital requirement. And I guess the deadline is what? 31st December? So 1st of January, you must have that. Or else, um, from what I've read, you will trigger what the law says you should trigger. Um, so let's assess that. And the banks have, the local banks particularly, have been going around, they've been to parliament, they've been to the president. Uh, it's been one of the most controversial issues, um, trying to get some sort of intervention because they say it's, you're probably gonna kill us. In fact, the direct accusation is you are forcing banks to either fold up or merge. Uh, what, so we are close to December. Um, you get to December. You know the, the roadmap you've laid for them to get there. How are the banks performing in terms of 
meeting that requirement by December from where you sit? Actually, they're doing very well. You've already heard a number of banks already announce that they've met the requirement or they're very close to meeting the requirement. And at Bank of Ghana, we have the banks come talk to us all the time and show us all the progress they're making. And we're very hopeful. We're actually very hopeful that the banks will meet this requirement by themselves on the strength of their balance sheet um, or by injecting new capital, or inviting new investors, or by merging. And we, we know that all of, these, uh, all of these options are being explored very um, actively by the banks. And so we, we actually have no concern at all. You have no concerns from what you've seen. All the banks, but you, you actually suggest some of them will not have a choice than to merge. In other words, you know, give up and join somebody else so they can get a 400 million. That, that will happen inevitably. Which, which is by itself not a bad thing. Okay. All over the world, we have seen examples of that working very well and creating a much stronger financial system. So that by itself, mergers would not be a bad idea. If banks came together to say, we think we're going to merge to meet this requirement and become a stronger and a better bank, it would actually very much encourage that. Kwabena, you and the banking sector, so you give me your brief comment on, on I'm not going to ask you the question on directly. Your brief comment on that ultimate objective of getting all of you to 400 million. What's your own assessment of it working in the banking sector as a banker yourself? Well, first of all, I think um, I would agree with the second deputy governor in, 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 in saying that it is on track. And I know it becomes a very emotive issue, but we must remember that within the financial system, there are several financial intermediaries, and not all of them are banks. And so and a lot of these institutions were other, were other forms of financial intermediaries before they became banks. Um, even for the very, very big local as well as international banks, they, they, they existed in one form or the other before they became banks. I think that the two approaches that have been positioned for the banks that will likely struggle to meet the 400 million, which is either to merge or to take up a license, or to give up the banking license and take a license in another part of the financial system is not calamitous. I think there's, there, there's several savings and loans as well as financial institutions that are intimidating, and some of them intimidating at a greater extent than banks. So I think, I know it's a very emotive issue, but it's important to remember that in the financial system, there are different types of financial intermediaries, and if 400 is a figure that is too big, I'm sure with the amount of capital that they have, there are other forms of financial intimidation that they can undertake, and they will be as effective, if not, effective, if not more effective than they are as a bank. But it's an emotive issue, no doubt, but I think that it's important to remember that the regulator has at its disposal a lot of information that dictates the figure that um, is appropriate for the industry. Is this figure justified then based on what you know? I think it is. You know, because they've been accused of being arbitrary. If, you've been, if you're a bank that has been exposed to a bad loan, and a bad loan that leads to total loss, and if you think about what your single, oblig your single counterparty limit, which the banks refer to as your SOL, um, at 400 million, I think that figure 25% on a secured basis will be 100 million. What it means is that if you have four counterparties who you've extended money to, and all four go bust, it wipes away your capital in theory. If it's not 100 million and it's 50 million, you need eight counterparties to go bust. Now, if you've been through any cyclical downturn, you would realize how quickly the bad loans can cascade. And at that point in time, the only buffer you have is your capital. And unfortunately, there's a tendency for businesses to only look for capital when the going gets tough, which is why it becomes a bit of a problem. If, 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 if businesses and banks included make it a habit to look for capital in the, in the good times, then it becomes less of a challenge. And that's what we're facing right now in that 
there are lots of institutions looking for capital, and the 400 figure, unfortunately, seems like a high figure because lots of institutions are looking for that amount of money. But I think that having experienced this industry for 21 years, I dare say that that figure is, 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 is the appropriate one. And Vish, so 400 million, um, is that a silver bullet to solve our problems? So once all the banks are capitalized at that level by January 1, 20, 2019, does that then get us to the point to say, yes, we've arrived as a banking industry? Um, I don't think you can ever say that you've arrived. I think the objective of the capitalization exercise, like Kwame Na and Deputy Governor said, is to strengthen the banks so that they are in a better position to absorb any shocks that arise. But of course, in the normal course of trading, um, you will make some losses. Um, the challenge going forward, irrespective of how much capital you may have, is to manage the risk so that you can limit those losses. So even if we get to 400 million, uh, and by the way, the 400 million is the minimum. In other words, you may require um, a little bit more than that, depending on what type of business you're doing. Um, it is possible that you, you lose some of that capital, depending on what happens and depending on how you manage your own risk. So I don't think we can um, say that come 1st January 2019, we would have arrived. I think we would hopefully see a stronger banking system. Um, but with that, we should also remain conscious of the risks that remain, some of which are market risk and not internal to the bank specifically. Uh, so those issues will remain. It's just that the banks should hopefully be in a stronger position to mitigate those risks or to absorb whatever shocks come uh, from risk. Um, but the issues Deputy Governor spoke about in terms of governance, in terms of operational risks, those will still be there, and those will continue to need to be addressed. And very quick, brief questions, and then I'll give the last hour, whole hour to my audience, so we can broaden the conversations. And now, all these will come to you, um, Madam Awaji. Uh, very specific questions. One, how is Unibank doing? Because you've, you've uh, appointed um, uh, receivership, and how are they doing the last few months? Because you give it six months, correct? They're good, they're supposed to be, we need to quick update on this, because, uh, uh, people's monies are, are still there. Um, how are they doing in terms of turning around? Oh, thank you very much. So let me just say that Unibank is not under receivership. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Unibank is under, is under official administration yes. with KPMG acting as official administrators. Um, what they're doing is to take an inventory of the assets and liabilities of the bank. Um, as supervisors, we were getting uh, regular returns from this institution, and we were also conducting an uh, on-site examination. But with a bank and a private management, it's difficult to get all the information you need. With KPMG in there, we get access to all the information that we need in terms of the state of affairs. That work is ongoing. Uh, that's very quickly leading. It's been two months, uh, six weeks, actually. That's very quickly leading into an assessment of the options for restructuring the bank based on where things are. And there are various options open uh, to us, all of which are provided for under the Banks and Special Deposit uh, Taking Institutions Act. And um, with more clarity in terms of where things are, we will be able to come up with a plan of action. But so happy with the Happy with the last two months? How is it? We're fine, yes. Yeah. So it's, um, everything is going on well. We've stabilized things. Um, the bank is still in operation. It's still open for business. Uh, some of you may still have accounts with a bank which you're operating. So uh, customers are bringing in more money. Um, every, all the banking operations are fully functional and everything is fine. It's stable. Okay. It's stable. We're trying to get a hold, um, a quick handle on where things really are and what the options are for restructuring the bank to make it a better, a, a better bank going and, forward. And another key question before I go to the audience, and this has also been one of the key controversial points, and I'm speaking here as, as a customer of, of a bank. The concern is, and I've seen the, uh, both the minority and majority members on the finance committee agree on this, and they rarely do agree, that the uh, directors of the banks that have gone under, UT and Capital, should be made to face the music. You, the, the state should stay out of it and, and get them sanctioned 
quite strongly. They issued a joint statement on this. Um, where are we on that? Because it gives me confidence as a, as a, as a customer that if something goes wrong with my funds, the people who make the decisions that got me worrying about my funds are not only held accountable, but they are sanctioned appropriately. What's, what's a Bank of Ghana doing about this? This has been a year, and we're yet to see the real sanctions applied in the case of the, of the directors uh, who made the decisions. Well, let me say that the Bank of Ghana um, has already taken action, um, working with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, some reports have been made to IOKO, which you may have heard about. So IOKO is investigating the matter, has made invitations to directors, managers of these other two banks that were put in receivership last year. Um, you, you, um, unique UT Bank and um, Capital, Capital Bank, Capital. right? Uh, so that work is ongoing. Uh, we're not uh, law enforcement. We're not official investigators. We did have some investigations. We did, we did conduct some investigations out of which we submitted reports uh, together with Price, Pricewaterhouse um, to EOCO, and that matter is ongoing. We will let them do their work. And we have said that once we're clear on what went wrong and who is culpable, we will not shield anyone. Uh, many of that, some of that work would have to be done by law enforcement agencies um, and uh, prosecutorial agencies, like attorney generals, um, others, depending on what comes out as the final report. Um, but whatever lies within our power to do, we will do. And we will not shield anyone who is found culpable. In the case of Unibank, it's early days yet. Uh, a lot of the work is still ongoing, uh, getting to the bottom of things. And the same principle would apply.